building a few houses isn't enough to make a neighborhood. You also need to build the roads and sidewalks to connect them. Same with an integrated circuit. You can stick a billion transistors on an IC, but they're useless if you cannot also connect them. That is what interconnects are for. There are wires for transmitting the electrical signals between transistors and other circuit elements. For over 30 years, we used to make these interconnects and their insulating layers from aluminum and silicon dioxide respectively. But by the late 1990s, it became technically necessary to use new materials. Big technology transitions are opportunities for certain companies to pull ahead of the rest. In this case, that certain company was TSMC. In this video, we're going to look at another one of the semiconductor industry's major transitions, the transition to copper slash low K interconnects. But first, let me talk about the Asianometry Patreon. Early access members get to see new videos and selected references for those videos first. Usually videos do whatever they do, but I'm a little worried about this one since it's so niche. So early access helps a lot. Thanks, and on with the show. Since these interconnects are made from metals, the industry calls the process of laying these down metallization. As a back end of the line process, we do this metallization after we make the transistors on the wafer. The step where we produce those silicon transistors is called, what else? The front end of the line. So at the start of metallization, we have the wafer with its transistor circuitry etched into the silicon. To get our interconnects, we then put on layers of fine metal wiring called metal layers on top of the transistors. The metal layers are separated by layers of an insulating dielectric material. The technical term for these is intermetal dielectric layers, which is as literal a name as you can possibly hope for. We will also need to cut holes into the intermetal dielectric layers to connect together multiple metal layers. We call these vias. So initially you might think of an integrated circuit as this flat idyllic landscape of silicon circuitry. Wrong my dudes, today's advanced ICs are more like Hong Kong's old Kowloon walled city. Layers and layers jumbled on top of one another, intricately interconnected. So we just want our interconnects to work. Is that too much to ask? Apparently not, because reality sucks. We need to talk about something known as RC delay. The RC in RC delay stands for resistance capacitance. All wires have resistance in them. Resistance impedes the flow of electrons through the metal, degrading the signal and losing energy. A wire's resistance is dependent on its material and proportional to its length. So thicker, shorter, and wider wires have less resistance. And then there is capacitance, which refers to objects' abilities to store charge. Because the wires are so physically close to each other and have these insulating dielectric layers in between them, the whole setup stores charge. Why? It is because the setup mimics a real-life capacitor, two conductors with a dielectric between them. This higher unwanted capacitance slows down the interconnect's ability to carry signals. So resistance and capacitance join up to create something called RC delay. It is the extra time for an electric signal to travel through an interconnect. The longer the RC delay, the longer it takes for signals to propagate throughout the chip. A way that I have seen it explained is like filling a bucket of water. Resistance is like how fast we can put water into the bucket and capacitance refers to the bucket's literal size. How fast it takes to fill the bucket with water, that is our RC delay. A single microchip has several types of interconnects within them. The lowest layers of metal wires to go on top of the transistors are referred to as the local interconnects. As the name implies, local interconnects connect local blocks of adjacent elements, kind of like the small roads and streets in your neighborhood. Since these interconnects don't have to go so far, we can make them thinner and put them closer to each other. But since they are so close to the transistor layer, they also need to be more heat resistant. We commonly produce these local interconnects from materials like polysilicon, tungsten, or aluminum. Higher up on the chip, we have global interconnect layers. These are larger, longer connections that span large portions of the chip. 
So you can imagine that they are like city avenues or even highways, connecting together large neighborhood blocks. These global interconnects are also used to deliver other signals necessary for chip operation. Clock signals to synchronize the chip's different parts, power to operate the chip, so on. Because they have to cover large distances within the chip, we want their resistance to be as low as possible. So we make them to be as thick as possible and use low resistivity metals to produce them. In between the global and local metal layers, we have medium distant metal layers. These have a variety of names like semi-global interconnects or intermodule interconnects, so on. You tend to find more metal layers on logic chips than memory chips. Memories might have perhaps three to five metal layers. There are a few reasons for this. First, memory has a repetitive, very dense structure that doesn't need a lot of interconnects. Second, memories tend to have a bumpy structure. There might be things like trench capacitors, deep holes in the silicon used for storing electrical charges. Logic chips, on the other hand, are more irregular with less device density, but it is more important that they are connected the right way so we generally need more interconnects and more metal layers, sometimes 10 to 15. In the beginning, we used silicon dioxide for the intermetal dielectric layer and aluminum for the interconnects, especially the global ones. The primary reason for this is that both silicon dioxide and aluminum are very easy to work with in manufacturing. You can easily lay down a good thick layer of silicon dioxide in between the metal layers thanks to chemical vapor deposition tools. And as for aluminum, the metal has the fourth lowest resistance behind silver, copper, and gold. It also works well with the silicon dioxide in a manufacturing context. Here's how we do it. We start with a layer of silicon dioxide. Now we lay down a plain thick layer of aluminum on top of the silicon dioxide. We then use lithography to transfer the pattern over to the aluminum metal layer, and then simply etch away the parts we don't need. There, we have a metal layer done. If we still have more metal layers to do, then we need to deposit another layer of intermetal dielectric on top of this metal, polishing it down so that we can start again with a smooth, flat surface. Aluminum and silicon dioxide suit each other. When you lay down that aluminum metal layer on top of the silicon dioxide dielectric, the two react to create aluminum oxide or alumina. This alumina layer acts like a protective sheath, preventing the rest of the aluminum atoms from diffusing into the rest of the silicon dioxide. For the first 30 years of semiconductor technology, this process worked quite well, until it didn't. Over time, chips got more dense. Transistors got smaller. We were putting more of them onto a single chip. More transistors means more interconnects. And generally, semiconductor designers scaled the interconnect system in two ways. They first shrank the size of the interconnects. For instance, the pitch or the distance between two parallel wires. But this raises the electrical resistance of the wires. More resistance means more RC delay, slowing down the chip. So, Engineers responded by simply making the wires relatively taller. But there is a limit to how much taller these wires can stand up over the rest of the landscape. This step-like structure is difficult to work with in manufacturing. Just imagine trying to coat and etch such even angles at nanometer scale. Not to mention, denser cluster of wires leads to more unwanted capacitance. More capacitance means more RC delay, slowing down the chip. So let's just add more, 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 more metal layers, right? Well, this has its own set of process challenges. These layers still have to go through the semiconductor game loop of depositing thin layers, transferring the pattern onto them using lithography, and then etch. The more stacked metal layers there are, the more chances we have to mess things up. The more chances to mess things up, the worse the yield will be, and bad yields make the chip less economically viable. In the beginning, manufacturers and designers did not much care about RC delay. That is because the RC delay was smaller than the delays from the circuit devices themselves. But as time progressed and chips have gotten more complicated, RC delay has become a more significant contributor 
to the chip's final speed. By the mid-1990s, it became clear that things could not progress the same way they had before. In 1978, IBM reported that the interconnect pitch for the second metal layer, called M2, was about 20 micrometers. Remember, M2 is a local interconnect, so the thinnest. By 1994, the interconnect pitches on the highest global layers, which are supposed to be the widest, were 1.8 micrometers. New technological changes convinced the industry to use aluminum interconnect technology for one more generation, the 250 nanometer node, which started ramping up in 1996, but the end loomed. Looking ahead to the 100 nanometer process node scheduled a few years away, it would take six times as long to transmit a signal through a one millimeter long interconnect as it would to send it through an equivalent sized transistor. Lame. They might as well put the signals on a mail pigeon. So we need to figure out a way to fix this RC delay issue. The way the scientists came up with was to replace the interconnect system's materials. First, we changed the low resistivity metals in the interconnects themselves from aluminum to copper. This was an obvious choice. Copper lines have 35% less resistance than their aluminum counterparts. Second, we can cut unwanted capacitance by changing the material in the insulating dielectric layer from silicon dioxide to another one that carries less charge. We measure a substance's ability to store charge using a factor called dielectric constant or K value. So this new material needed to have a K value lower than that of the traditionally used silicon dioxide, 3.9. It was referred to as low K dielectric, creative. Together, a copper and low K solution lets manufacturers do fewer metal layers and thinner wires, potentially cutting the RC delay time by a factor of four. In September 1997, IBM shocked the semiconductor world when they announced that they had successfully produced copper interconnects. They had been working on the problem for 15 years. As the project, codenamed Red Aluminum, ramped up, a team of IBM engineers worked 18 hours a day in secret. Engineer Ron Goldblatt recalled standing at the IBM parking lot at 3 a.m., wondering if he should bother driving home. He says, there was a real period of time when we lost all track of time. They couldn't pay someone enough to make them do it. It has to be a different sense of motivation. It was a triumphant achievement capped by one of the most famous images in semiconductor history. Six layers of copper interconnects. Beautiful. IBM said that they intended to mass produce copper wired wafers by early 1998, with the first chips going to its critical customer, Apple Computer, for their Power Max. IBM's announcement was such a big deal because copper has some serious manufacturing problems. Aluminum and silicon are good friends manufacturing-wise. This is not the case with copper. First, copper atoms can quickly diffuse into silicon or silicon dioxide and accumulate there like mercury in a tuna. This hurts how well the chip can perform. They don't call it copper poisoning for nothing. So the semiconductor manufacturer must produce what is called a diffusion barrier to block off the copper from entering into the silicon. This barrier has to have special properties. It must stick to both the copper and locate insulation layers. It must not corrode, and we must be able to easily and evenly lay it down. We usually use materials made from tantalum. Perhaps most troublingly, you can't etch copper. Copper does not have a suitable etchant. This means that, unlike with aluminum, we cannot just deposit a layer of copper and etch away the parts we don't need. So we have to do something else. IBM decided to reverse the traditional sequence. Rather than subtract, we shall add. We start by first laying down the intermetal dielectric layer. Then we do lithography to transfer the interconnect patterns, including the trenches and vias, onto the dielectric. After that, we etch the pattern into the dielectric layer. So far, so good. Next, we apply the aforementioned diffusion barrier, our protection to keep the copper from slipping away. It is usually made from tantalum or some chemical compound with it. After this, we fill our trench with copper. This would be done using a method like electroplating. 
an electrochemical deposition process that IBM knew to be its secret sauce. More on that later. But we are not done. No, no, no. Before we finish, we have to sand off any excess copper and then apply a capping layer on top of the copper to keep it from diffusing where it shouldn't. Because this method kind of reminds you of the fancy metal inlay techniques they used back in the Middle Ages, this whole roundabout process was named after Damascus, the capital of Syria. The Damascene Method. Sounds complicated and unintuitive? It is. Semiconductor manufacturing is literally black magic. All of this stuff just barely works, man. Behind IBM's groundbreaking announcement was a series of cumulative technological advancements. We needed to have first discovered tantalum and tantalum nitride as having good diffusion barrier properties. Research on this started in the late 1980s and progressed through the early 1990s. And we needed to have invented the Damascene method, which was not particularly intuitive. IBM invented this sometime around 1985. But the biggest sticking point was how on earth were they going to fill the empty trenches and vias with copper. IBM tried various traditional semiconductor manufacturing methods like sputtering, physical vapor deposition, and chemical vapor deposition. All of these methods left defects. This was because they steadily applied copper atoms on the trenches side surfaces until the copper growth met in the middle. You end up with seams or voids. Finally, in 1989, a small group came across the idea of superfilling or bottoms up growth. Here we fill the trench from the bottom up like as if it were a regular liquid. This was only possible with electroplating. In 1993, a small team at IBM mixed this winning combo of diffusion barriers, damascene, and electroplating to produce multi-level copper wires. This was the first inkling that we can use copper instead of aluminum. However, this first damascene production method was not economically viable. The throughput and yields, particularly with the vias, did not meet IBM's internal requirements. Another IBM team, led by Dan Edelstein, re-engineered the process recipe. It includes what is called a dual damascene methodology that produced both the trenches and vias together at the same time. In 1995, this new recipe passed internal requirements and IBM committed to bringing it to high volume production. After two more years of development, they made the big announcement. But announcements of this or that breakthrough are a dime a dozen. Show it to me working in the fab. Doing it in high volume would be a formidable task for IBM's chip foundry, which had suffered from cost cuts throughout the 1990s. Since copper can poison the silicon and cause defects, we must keep it out of the rest of the fab. So tools on the copper lines, lithography, metrology, and otherwise, should be isolated. A tricky task to pull off since many fabs share tools across different lines. Oh, also, copper easily dissolves into water. Copper and water is quite toxic, so we need to install new waste disposal technologies in the fab in order to handle it. At the time of the November 1997 announcement, newspapers and others in the media declared IBM to be some one to three years ahead of their competitors. Then just two weeks after IBM's announcement, Motorola announced that they too had produced copper interconnects. How did everyone catch up so fast? Before 1989, IBM was the only company in the industry investigating copper interconnects. But after then, the whole industry realized the deficiencies of aluminum interconnects and that something else had to replace it. Copper was an obvious choice. People also sensed through IBM's published papers and other subtle signs that Big Blue was working on something with copper. So the other companies slowly got into it. Motorola started their copper work in 1990, having caught wind of it through their alliance with IBM for the PowerPC chip. IBM never told them anything, but Motorola guessed through changes that IBM made to the PowerPC design rules that some sort of copper breakthrough was nigh. AMD sometime in 1995. They were slow but quickly ramped up. And AT&T, Bell Labs, around the same time. Interestingly, AT&T developed their entire copper interconnect stack separately from IBM. Perhaps most surprisingly, Intel didn't start their copper interconnect program 
until 1997, and that is despite their own researchers having published a paper on using electroplating to produce copper interconnects back in 1989. So in the few years before IBM's big announcement, the number of published articles on copper interconnect technology steadily rose. Much of this research was done through Semitech. Semitech is an R&D consortium that helps coordinate public-private partnerships around the United States. Many executives at those companies also have positions at Semitech. Inspired by IBM's releases, they directed public R&D funds to universities to study the technology. The findings were released into the public domain, and the semiconductor companies hired grad students from those teams. So while IBM tried very hard to keep certain details of their work a secret, particularly the copper fill part of it, the rest of the semiconductor industry rapidly caught up. As I mentioned, the next leading edge node was 180 nanometers, scheduled for high volume in 1999. This major node saw a large series of technical changes. First, 180 nanometers, they called it 0.18 microns at the time, not only had the copper interconnects, but also another 30% reduction in feature size as per Moore's law. Second, it was about the same time the fabs started receiving new 193 nanometer DUV eczema laser lithography tools, so they were learning these at the same time. And third, the 300 millimeter wafer transition was supposed to happen with this node too. But considering all the things that were already going on, Intel and the rest of the industry opted to push that back one to two more years to the 130 nanometer node. In 1998, IBM kicked off the 180 nanometer generation with the PowerPC 750CX. The copper interconnects indeed sped up these chips from 300 to 400 megahertz, leapfrogging IBM to first place in the technological race. Coming up close behind them was Motorola. They decided to do a half node in between 250 and 180 nanometers, rolling out a 220 nanometer node in late 1998. The first chips that come out with this were the PowerPC G4 chips, which powered Apple's classic titanium PowerBook G4 and iBook G4 laptops. It is important to note that the semiconductor manufacturing industry had far more players back then, Everyone had their own variant of the 180 nanometer generation, and so people picked and chose what parts of the spec they wanted to adopt for their own variant. An example of this is that Intel's 180 nanometer process did not use copper interconnects. This was for two reasons. First, like I mentioned earlier, they were late to copper. And second, Intel needed a process that they can scale, rapidly scale, to massive quantities for their PC CPU monopoly, about 112,200 millimeter wafers per month by the year 2000. And at the time, there were not enough copper tools coming out of the suppliers. Intel would not implement copper interconnects until November 2000 with the following 130 nanometer node. And even then, those chips had just six layers out of the seven made from copper. Across the Pacific, we had the Asian foundries, the largest of which were TSMC and UMC in Taiwan. They started from even further behind the American companies. Until 1997, they never even seriously considered copper. Now they had to very quickly learn. TSMC had struggled with their 250 nanometer process, leaving the door open for their fierce rival. UMC was rapidly catching up. Their revenue growth from 1995 to 1999 exceeded TSMC's, putting the two companies neck to neck in terms of foundry market share, 30 to 27 percent. And critically, UMC was catching up in terms of capacity. At the end of 1999, UMC had 1.7 million 8-inch wafers of capacity compared to TSMC's 1.9 million 8-inch wafers. UMC CEO John Shren said, the trends indicate that we will pass TSMC in revenue sometime next year. Right now, it's a capacity game, and if we want to pass them, we have to increase our capacity. TSMC has stayed fairly flat for the past few years, while we are growing significantly. We will catch them very soon. TSMC Chairman and CEO Morris Zhang wasn't going to let that happen on his watch. While ramping up 250 nanometers, he cycled through three VPs of R&D, 
before one guy finally got the job done. Dr. Zhang Xiangyi, who joined in mid-1997 and worked day and night for over four straight months. Hitting the next node, 180 nanometers, would require copper, but neither TSMC nor UMC had any experience in it. How were they going to learn about this? The two companies opted for different paths. UMC decided to join an IBM-sponsored research consortium, I believe it was the Semiconductor Research Corporation, to collectively do research on copper interconnects, so they benefited from IBM's patents. TSMC, on the other hand, decided to go it alone. A team of six elite semiconductor scientists led a crash effort to develop a TSMC-only copper interconnect implementation. The team was Bern Lin, Yang Guanglei, Jiang Xiangyi, Jack Sun, Douglas Yu, and of course, Dr. Liang Mong Song. I did a video about him a while back. Go watch it. Both methods worked to some extent. In 1999, both UMC and TSMC started shipping 180 nanometer chips to fabless customers with the top two metal layers made with copper. This lagged behind IBM's 180 nanometer copper chips, which had six out of the seven layers made from copper, but nevertheless, it was a commendable step towards full copperization. Now I want to shift gears a bit. For a while now, I've been talking about copper. Copper, copper, copper. Those of you who paid attention at the start, you might have noticed that I have so far ignored one other piece of the story. Copper is just one half of the interconnect system, the half for addressing increasing wire resistance. We still need a good low K material for the intermetal dielectric layers for cutting down unwanted capacitance. The big problem was that the semiconductor industry did not have a really good low K material to replace silicon dioxide, particularly one that fit well into the process flow. The materials just kept falling apart or failed the reliability metrics. What makes the low K dielectric situation so tricky compared to the copper situation was that with copper, we know what we are dealing with. Working with copper was challenging, but ultimately, it was just a materials engineering problem. But with low K, we don't even know what we need to engineer. The semiconductor industry tried to do low K three times. First, at the 250 nanometer node, they doped the traditional silicon dioxide with fluorine to create fluorinated silicon glass, or FSG. FSG's K value was just slightly lower than traditional silicon dioxide, about 3.5 versus 3.9, and you applied it with chemical vapor deposition. At the 180 nanometer node, the industry tried another substance called hydrogen silsesquidoxine, or HSQ. It has a lower K, about 2.8. They would try applying this HSQ material onto the wafers using a technique called spin-on. Spin-on is exactly what you might think it is. You spin the wafer very quickly and then pour on the low K dielectric such that it spreads out over the wafer. It was seen as a cheaper way to produce a good even layer. The HSQ spin-on technique passed all the internal tests, but in high volume production it failed to scale apparently because spin-on combined with the high temperatures of fab production stressed the HSQ layer and caused it to distort beyond acceptable parameters. This was a major problem. TSMC immediately freaked out and typed git reset hard, except it wasn't that easy in real life. Jiang recalls, We found out at the last moment after we already went to production, and then it was around Christmas time and we immediately tried to put the FSG back. So again, we worked days and at night, no break for Christmas, no break for New Year, no break for Chinese New Year, all the way and under very high pressure. They were not alone in this grief. Texas Instruments suffered through the same situation as well. And even with all their efforts, TSMC still shipped 180 nanometers late. The next major node after 180 nanometers TSMC did a minor 150 nanometer node in between, was 130 nanometers. 130 would be legendary. Here, the industry expected to have completed the copper interconnect transition 
and also have a true low-K dielectric layer material. The big question again was, what material should they use? UMC, IBM, and Infineon worked together on their 130 nanometer node variant. On April 2000, IBM again announces another technical breakthrough. They would be adopting a proprietary new low-K material from Dow Chemical called Silk, applied again with a spin-on technique. Silk had a dielectric constant or K value of 2.6 and maybe even 2.2, which would fulfill Fab's needs for until the 65 nanometer node generation. It was a bold technological choice. But several in the industry, including Texas Instruments, argued for another path. TI favored a different low-K dielectric material called Black Diamond from Applied Materials. Its K value was about 2.8, similar to Silk. The catch was that Black Diamond was exclusive to chemical vapor deposition. You cannot apply it onto the wafers with the spin-on technique. Makes sense. It's Applied Materials, after all. They'll use CVD to butter their breakfast croissants if they had the choice. So the larger semiconductor industry split into two over this decision of which low-K dielectric to go with for their flavors of the 130 nanometer node. IBM, UMC, and their affiliates, Silk, Texas Instruments chose to go with Black Diamond, which sounds like a fast racehorse or a particularly pungent perfume. TSMC as well. In their case, literally just because Dr. Jiang personally swore that he would never again touch the spin-on technique. Intel, for their part, apparently chose to stick with the older second-generation FSG technique, again because of their larger capacity needs. In the end, the Silk plus spin-on setup failed. IBM failed to ship a product with it. UMC's customers failed to ship a product with it. A technical decision with a dear financial and strategic cost. On October 2001, TSMC became the first to ship 130 nanometer chips with both copper interconnects and low-K dielectric. To ensure customers like NVIDIA got their chips, TSMC offered an alternate FSG dielectric version. Their primary fabs for this node were Fab 6 and 12 in Shinchu. It took some time. Yields for products like NVIDIA's NV30 started off in the teens, but by late 2002, they got them to 70% and higher. At the end of 2001, soon after TSMC started shipping, UMC signaled defeat. They defected from IBM and Infineon, dropping Silk for a CVD process from Novellus Systems. It was a costly, bad choice. Strangely, IBM said nothing about this until 2002, when one of their biggest fabless customers, Xilinx, very publicly announced that their higher-end FPGAs would be delayed specifically because of Silk. Their president, Willem Rolands, later called them out in a 2003 Business Week interview, saying that while IBM was strong in technology, it needed to improve its manufacturing skills and move faster. A loss of face. IBM eventually switched to CVD2. Their team defended the Silk division with their CTO, Bernie Mayerson, saying in 2003, quite bluntly, there were a lot of reasons to run with Silk. On the surface, it looked like it had the potential to have a lower dielectric constant. No one else was doing it at the time, and we just made a decision. We ran with Silk. Instead of throwing rocks at us, the industry should be saying, thanks guys, you saved us from this. A disappointing close to a promising start. IBM Micro's inability to capitalize on its first hard-won innovative breakthrough would cost it. TSMC's monumental 130 nanometer node set the Taiwanese giant apart from everyone else. The Taiwanese government awarded TSMC's R&D team, the six R&D horsemen, the 2003 Outstanding Scientific and Technological Worker Award for their success. For years, TSMC was seen as a simple factory for meeting excess demand. In other words, producers, not innovators. People did not particularly respect their R&D chops. The 130 nanometer node changed everything. From then on, people in the industry now knew that TSMC should be a force to be reckoned with. All right, everyone, that's it for tonight. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to the channel, sign up for the newsletter, and I'll see you guys next time.